Hello everyone and thank you for joining me around the campfire tonight. It's a cool night in late July here in Middle Tennessee. We had some good rain a couple of days ago to kill off the late summer heat. The tree frogs and crickets are active tonight. I think I hear some katydids as well. The coyotes were howling a bit earlier and I have also heard a bullfrog chirp or two. Barred owls were a hoo-hooing a few hours ago. It's just been a very active night. Fireflies blink on and off out here and bats have been fluttering back and forth eating the mosquitoes that fly around the pond. The moon is bright. It's not yet full, but it's bright. It's a good night to talk about Bigfoot. So this is Sasquatch Society, the critical thinking podcast for the Bigfoot enthusiast. My name is Ron Reed and this is, well, episode zero of the show. On Sasquatch Society we will be talking about various topics pertaining to cryptozoology, paleontology, primatology, anthropology, paleoanthropology, evolution, wilderness survival, outdoor recreation, long distance hiking, environmental studies, climate change, psychology, analytics, and both physical and behavioral anatomy of various animal species alive today or otherwise extinct. We will also be actively exploring things like folklore around the world, various eyewitness testimonies, potential evidence, Bigfoot and cryptids in the news and media, gear reviews, book recommendations, field research and exploration, and classic Sasquatch reports from all over. That's just in a nutshell what I want to cover in this show. Um, I want this to be kind of an all-encompassing thing and touch base on various uh, subjects and subtopics related to Bigfoot and cryptozoology. Uh, but before we get into all of that, who am I and what is Sasquatch Society? So I grew up in the outdoors. I was born in upstate New York where my parents lived at the base of the Adirondacks. Uh, when I was a baby we moved on a nine acre plot in Middle Tennessee where I would spend my time exploring the forest and fields. I spent some time in the scouts and learned much about animals as a young child. I grew up in those days of the crocodile hunter and uh, Jeff Corwin and uh, was really active in to understanding and learning about the uh, natural world and animals. Uh, but I didn't get into cryptozoology until the show Animal X, which was an Australian produced show, uh, showed up on early morning uh, days during summer vacation on Animal Planet, which was my channel back in the day. And that's kind of where I had this interest in cryptozoology open up. And I looked at a lot of the stuff pertaining to chupacabras and dinosaurs in the African Congo and, and uh, lake monsters around the world. But Bigfoot really seemed like the most credible to me as a kid, so I stuck with it. But I also spent much of my youth practicing wilderness survival, building shelters and finding edible wild plants. I would document over 10 edible species of plant on my family property alone at least one for each season. I once hunted a squirrel to learn how to dress and eat small game. Mostly I just observed nature though. Not much of a hunter, though I practiced reading signs, stalking silently, and lining up the shot, more often with a camera than with a gun. After graduating high school, I flew alone out to Northern California at the age of 17, and I spent two weeks hiking in the Claymath Mountains, befriending natives on the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation, and ultimately sucking at backpacking. So at the time, I didn't know anything about lightweight gear, and I had 90 pounds worth of gear on two separate backpacks, one on the back, and then a smaller one on my front. So I was walking down the trail like a sumo wrestler. <laughs> um, but, you know, I returned from California to start college and took public speaking. Um, and we explored the online world and social media where I created Sasquatch Society a Facebook page as an experiment. Later I would share my travels through it and post videos on YouTube. So I've since been to the Smokies, the Florida Everglades, out west to Texas and Arkansas. I went to the Texas Bigfoot Conference two years in a row. I've explored several wetland environments and mountain ranges in search of skunk apes, woolly boogers, boojums, dogmen, river serpents, and other curiosities said to be of the natural world. I'm pretty much a solo investigator. 
only teaming up with others every once in a while, but ever since 2011, my dog Bandit has tagged along on most of my excursions. One of our greatest adventures was a 2,190-mile hike we took on the Appalachian Trail back in 2015 from Georgia to Maine. We'd do it all together. So, you know, now I'm thinking about it. He's somewhere around here laying around in the dark. I'm just going to grab my spotlight and check on him. Where are you at, Bandit? Oh, he's angry. I woke him up. But the idea of a podcast has been floating around for years. I've been in the subject for about 13 or 14 years now. And I grew up with the Bigfoot show, Sasquatch, the, the Bipcast or the Bigfoot Information Podcast. And, well, is it Big? <laughs> I think it's the Bigfoot Information Project Podcast. Bipcast, whatever it's called. And many others over the years. I tried many times in the past to do a podcast, but now I have a more refined approach and a clearer picture of the type of show I want to provide for you, my audience. So the purpose is to help the Bigfoot enthusiast understand our natural world and the various scientific laws that make it up. I want to help the skeptics understand Bigfoot is not an outlandish concept and that through forming of well-thought hypotheses, we can justify a scientific approach to cryptozoology. There is a necessity for both sides to understand the natural world with more depth. For the researchers and Bigfoot advocates, knowing our world helps reduce the common errors of assumption and misidentification. For skeptics, it helps to lay out all possibilities and be thorough so our arguments are more productive and an understanding can be reached for both sides. Ultimately, we as humans suffer from not being able to pull all of our options and considerations and put them on the table. We are bad at moderating the opinions and needs of two or more separate parties. Bigfoot is kind of a fun, neutral subject that shouldn't have us at each other's throats like the subjects of politics or religion. Although there will be times that we will inevitably end up crossing over for a spell, the idea is to kind of pick something like Bigfoot or just cryptozoology or those other kind of fun subjects to kind of keep it from getting too controversial. So just please respect that my opinions are my own and may differ from those of your own. The same goes for any guests or future co-hosts that may appear down the line. So why now? A very active time for me is kind of coming up um, and I post my videos from past ex expeditions and look forward to the larger future um, so the podcast is just it's it's a good time to do the podcast uh, in September I will be returning to Northern California to hike another trail and look for Bigfoot some the 360 mile Bigfoot trail will be the subject for a film I will be making in this this near future I will also be making stops on a coast-to-coast -coast road trip and maybe even journey north through Oregon and Washington straight up to Canada to very squatchy British Columbia. Uh, next year I also have a plan to pursue cryptids like the Yowie and Thylacine in Australia as well. Although these destinations are kind of up in the air so to speak, uh, I thought the podcast would have a very active start and could benefit from the exciting adventures and content I plan on creating within this next year. But this is really just an introduction to get the ball rolling. If you're interested, uh, just like us on Facebook, Sasquatch Society, and follow us as we examine this intriguing phenomenon. More content and social media expansion is in the works. But for now, it's just me trying to pull it all together by myself. So, yeah. Anyway, I wanted to end the episode with one of my favorite Bigfoot stories. It's a real classic in my opinion, and it was featured in several Northwest newspapers in the 1870s and later shared in John Green's Year of the Sasquatch. It's an interesting account by Samuel de Groot. Uh, not to be confused with Groot from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Last fall, I was hunting in the mountains, about 20 miles south of here, and camped five or six days in one place, as I have done every season for the past 15 years. 
Several times I returned to camp after a hunt and saw that the ashes and charred sticks from the fireplace had been scattered about. An old hunter notices such things and very soon gets curious to know the cause. Although my bedding and traps and little stores were not disturbed as I could see, I was anxious to learn who or what it was that so regularly visited my camp, for clearly the half-burnt sticks and cinders could not scatter themselves about. I saw no tracks near the camp, as the hard ground covered with leaves would show none. So I started in the circle around the place, and three hundred yards off, in damp sand, I struck the tracks of a man's feet, as I supposed, bare and of immense size. Now I was curious, sure, and I resolved to lay for the barefooted visitor. I accordingly took a position on the hillside about sixty or seventy feet from the fire, and securely hid in the brush. I waited and watched. Two hours and more I sat there, and wondered if the owner of the feet would come again, and whether he imagined what an interest he had created in my inquiring mind, and finally what possessed him to be prowling about there with no shoes on. The fireplace was on my right, when the spot where I saw the track was on my left, hid by the bushes. It was in this direction that my attention was mostly directed, thinking the visitor would appear there. Besides, it was easier to sit and face that way. Suddenly I was surprised by a shrill whistle, such as boys produce with two fingers under their tongues, and turned quickly. I ejaculated, Good God! as I saw the object of my solicitude standing beside the fire and looking suspiciously around. It was the image of a man, but could not have been human. I was never so benumbed with astonishment before. The creature, whatever it was, stood fully five feet high and disproportionately broad and square at the fore shoulders, with arms of great length. The legs were very short and the body long. The head was small compared with the rest of the creature, and appeared to be set upon the shoulders without the neck. The whole was covered with dark brown and cinnamon colored hair, quite long on some parts, that of the head standing in a shock and growing close down to the eyes, like a digger Indian's. As I looked, he threw his head back and whistled again, and then stopped and grabbed a stick from the fire. This he swung round until the fire at the end had gone out when he repeated the maneuver. I was dumb almost, and could only look. Fifty minutes I sat and watched him as he whistled and scattered my fire about. I could easily have put a bullet through his head, but why should I kill him? Having amused himself, apparently, as he desired with my fire, he started to go, and, having gone a short distance, returned, and was joined by another, a female, unmistakably, when both turned and walked past me within twenty yards of where I sat and disappeared in the brush. I could not have had a better opportunity for observing them, as they were unconscious of my presence. The only object in visiting my camp seemed to be to amuse themselves with swinging lighted sticks around. I have told this story many times since then, and it has often raised an incredulous smile, but I have met one person who has seen the mysterious creatures and a dozen of whom have come across their tracks at various places between here and Pacheco Pass. Uh, so yeah, I really like that story. Um, I don't think I'm really going to get into whether or not it really happened. Uh, it seems like a very unusual story. To me, I think it's uh, it's got a, a shred of credibility because it's such a unique tale. Um, these old trappers accounts and stuff of wild men in the woods, so many times we think of these, these uh, really elaborate uh, attacks with the wild man or going to war with the wild man or... or or merrily escaping the, the wrath of the wild man, or capturing one, and, and it mysteriously disappears. But the reason I like this story is it's just this guy 
he's talking about something messing around with his fire. And when he goes to investigate, a couple of little adolescent-sized wild creatures come out and start um, playing with the fire. And that's something that, as, as a kid growing up around a campfire, that's something you used to love doing. It was like a poor man's sparklers. You know, you, you grab a, a stick on it with the, the end of it on fire, and you you spin it around until it's just a glowing ember at the tip, and then you write in the air with it, you know, and make little whirls and circles, and and uh, it just seems like something that, that a young adolescent Bigfoot would do. Um, to entertain itself, you know, in, in the remote wilderness, you know, sneak up and look around camp and play with the fire because you don't have a total understanding of what it is or how it works. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's just one of my, uh, favorites there. And I really like those old accounts that are, uh, prior to the 1900s. Um, they really just, uh, they really kind of sum up the the remoteness of the wilderness and the mysteriousness of 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 the forest and the mountains at that time. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I just wanted to share that with you guys before heading out tonight. Um, other than that, though, this is just the very beginning. So uh, stay tuned and. Uh, We'll have some good stuff on the way. Just, uh, until then, I'm just gonna sit here, watch the fire die out, and listen to all the night sounds before turning in and going to bed. Thanks for listening.